strange visual. Mm -hmm. I am quite new to the United States. I've been working as an IT consultant for uh, more than 20 years. Um, I have worked a lot when I with Linux when I, when I started working, but then my company was bought by EDS, and so um, they had special standards, and Windows was one of them. So I just got a little out of Linux at that time, and I'm yeah currently getting more in it because I'm uh, self-employed currently as an as a consultant and. I'm very interested in security, and so I installed uh, Backtrack and Kali Linux and all that stuff. And yeah, so I'm currently getting back into into Linux again. You came from where? Germany. Germany. Oh, okay. The the best economy in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 hopped out of the frying pan in the fire. <laughs> I think it's the weather. It's pretty attractive. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of the reasons, yeah. <laughs> so, Andy, have you been working on anything cool lately? That you can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, since my boss has been actually asking me if I can do a demo Very done. next week, uh, yes, I've uh, been working on, uh, actually, Brian knows this already, that's why he asked. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> I asked because ask you're the first on the list and I know your name. Ah, you're the first over here and I know your name. Um, he's done most of the, the hard work on this, actually. Um, we've got some Bluetooth low energy beacons in the office that we've been playing with. Are you not with Bush and McCullers anymore? No. Oh, I lost okay. that. <laughs> yeah, that was then you missed the whole part of his introduction, man. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't realize, I thought you met, moved inside and realized you left no, the company. I left oh, the okay. company, which, which actually turned out to be great because about a week later, they let go the entire department that I was part of. <laughs> They're selling mine. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, we've got these Bluetooth low energy beacons that. Um, you're supposed to be able to tell by the energy signature how far away from them you are, um, which turns out gets pretty squirrely as far as the actual distance. Um, so we've been doing some experimentation and some things around that that I think we're going to be able to demo at next week's Pinellas slug meeting. Cool. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'll have to miss it. So how is it judging distance? Is it, does it ping it? Does it triangulate? Or, the or crazy The API math? that we were given says that it's using the received st signal strength indicator and presumably doing crazy math on that, but it's all hidden in the API, so we don't really know what it's doing. So you say ping, and it says number, distance. Well, you, you say, what Bluetooth low energy beacons are around me? Gotcha. And it gives you back a list. And then you can go through that list and, and query and say, uh, you know, how far away do you think they are? Or you can just say, do you think they're well, see, the audio is here. immediately close well, to me, this is over here. near me, or far away from me? And you can get the, I've never the had response that way. The, same side either, cool. so. um, the RSSI thing seems to be comparing the expected signal strength to the received signal strength. Like, can you monkey with it by putting like a sheet of metal in between and something yes. says it's a mile yes. away or something? <laughs> yes. <you> yes. <laughs> but you get about the same results by having air in between your Android device and the beacon. Yeah, we, we, we actually have this, this big log of, oh, it's like, well, we have one big log that has 30 minutes worth of data. Um, yeah. So you somebody with a phone and you say, it's run that direction. It's like this, all the time. Or, oh. It's like, it's not. Who tested this? We did. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this Oops. is the thing. We ended up setting up on the roof of our parking garage so we'd be as far away from everything as we could at one meter increments to different devices and then um, Android devices moving out in one meter increments so we could test yeah. those measurements. And it's all, all this just all over. And that's what you get with Bluetooth uh, signals is just. Um, inconsistent single strings. Um, 
could it be that your whatever you use your Bluetooth transmitter is varying its power levels and that's screwing everything up? Possibly. Uh, it also could be. But there's nothing in the API that we have available to us to, to, to make any kind of change. Would you control the phone at least? Yes. You should be able to max out whatever its Bluetooth settings are. As indicated. We can talk about that. I don't know if there's any uh, individual settings. Actually, had multiple antennas, and we looked at a company called Buzzbee that's trying to make an app so like they can give us uh, put those um, receivers on TVs instead of bar. And that in if that you're sitting in front of a TV, you'll get that. It'll tell you to enter in like a coupon. So code. I've got an awesome. I've got an awesome app. Which the source code's actually available for for my phone. So my phone has an IR transmitter. It's a TV. And it is programmed with the codes for just about every brand. So you can be sitting in some public place and you don't like the TV was on. You just go off. You can also script it. So you can just have it seek setting off and you can just set your phone on the table aimed in the general right general direction. And every 30 seconds or so the TV will just turn off. I don't know what's going on. Obviously no one is doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this guy is the same thing. Oh, no, talking about the, um, the, the TV can go on? Uh, no, this is an app on my phone because HTC has an IR sender on the. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the TV can be going and does the same thing. Do they have like a permanent mode where you. Let's see, that's that. This is what? If it doesn't, you could that's that. easily hack it so that it did. That's more like. That's more. I suspect the, the all the way down. There are are they all the way down? Or something. What? Are they, sometimes if you don't push them all the way down. Ah. There you go. Hey, look at that. So how about you, Chucky? Are you working on any, any cool projects that you can share with the rest of us? Um, I'm still working on the same one that I presented at uh, HCC at home. That work because they're selling my group. I'm working on selling my group. <laughs> and are they, they going to sell you with it? I don't know. Huh? It's on the table, but I don't really want to move. So um. more than likely, I will not sell myself and switch into find job mode. Okay. Um, take a look at not to uh, in, in oh, this because it might be cool. Ta definitely take a look at careers.mozilla.org. I'm not saying this because I get a hell of money if I recommend someone and they get hired, <laughs> honestly. But do you also get a hell of money if you... I do get a hell of money if I recommend someone and they get hired. That's not why you're recommending someone. No, no, I'm thinking because Chachki has a chance. <laughs> <laughs> because I, you're only, I only get, like, you only get a certain number of slots, I think, that you can use. So here, I have a couple of things. I'm going to talk about SSH guard, but... Uh, I, a lot. Someone was talking about how they had used command lines before in DOS, no, no. Good idea. and then and they've had. And if you've used command lines like on DOS or, or other things like CPM or something old, you're and and then you and this this guy walks up to you with his with his bright green shoes and his <laughs> beard, and he's like, "Man, I love using the command line." And you think, "Oh, that kid's crazy." It's because things have really changed, and like the most recent thing that I've done, and this is like the last couple of days, I turned this feature on. It's been really cool, and it's very minor. It's just like commands that I type are colored depending on what they are, which is really interesting because if you type a command that does not exist, it's ugly and red. And if I type the name of a file, let's look at some files out of my directory. So those are some directories, and they're colored too, but everyone's been doing that for the last 20 years. But if I type the name of a file on the command line that exists, it, it, it tells me that it exists. And granted, it's also the color of a of a bad command, but I can fix that. So you can also tell it exists by using tab completion. You can also, but my tab completion is really awesome. So uh, LS is notorious for having a lot of options. That's LS's options there. And then this is a menu of all of LS's options. And uh, that's pretty cool. Oh, I don't have that. Good. Yeah, this is uh, ZSH. So. Uh, ZSH is pretty awesome. So uh, also command line options are yellow. The thing I really like about this, the thing that's highlighting and actually gets me is things like pipes. 
which you use to run multiple commands. Notice that really bright white color really makes them stick out. I, I just like that. Um, doesn't seem to noticeably slow down, no, slow down things. Are any um, of the new Linux users familiar with pipes at all? Or who, who's not familiar with pipes? Well, I'm not, I want to go into the specifics. I, I mostly mean I'm typing characters because the, the actual thing that's improved in the last 20 years with command line interfaces is not the fact that we can run commands. Because their command, whatever command language you have, that's all well and good, but the fact that it's easier. So the other thing I have is if I want to find a file, I can do this command and I can type like I've been working on. Uh, I'm a program. I'm probably working on a lot of PM, so that's all the PM files I've been working on. But I'm working on a web service one. So if I type, uh, get me the most recently added the web service file, so I can just press one and it out like that. So I can quickly get into a file that I've recently been working on. And it works from inside here too, so I, except it's, well, except it's trying to get to, uh, sorry, that's a, that's a bad example. That part's not working. And that's not the command line, that's my editor. Everyone has fancy editors, but the actual command line stuff is really cool. So the other thing I can do is if I want to edit a file and I know that it had a per, per part of a name in it, I have ultra tab completion, which works a little bit like that same file, web service, I don't remember what it's called, but uh, oh yeah, there's all the web service files I'm working on. Normally, I have a much larger display, so this actually looks a lot more manageable, but you all can't probably see it from there. So anyway, I keep tabbing away. It does the full path. So say, do you happen to like um, cat? Yeah, and it uh, just find it finds me the most recent file. Basically, that's in the text editor uh, of their VI, which is uh, blue because it's an alias. Uh, looks cool, and the file is red. Cool. So uh, it's, there's lots of things that are really nice, and it's just it's hard to say which in particular which thing helps me the most. But I end up during the day-to-day -day usage of, of living in the command line, I don't really notice this stuff, and it becomes second nature. But I type an awful few amount of things to change stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. So, but I'm not actually going to talk about that too much. I just wanted to say uh, during this during my little demonstration of SSH guard, you'll see a few more things and at some point I'm going to like publish a blog post about the different extensions I've installed or things I've written. Uh, hey Sam, have you heard about heard from Art? Yes. Okay. You want to be able to like it. Yeah, I heard that. I just he hadn't heard from you yet, so I wanted to make sure that you had touch base. Alright. So um like so uh, continuing on, I don't even think about these things, but I'm going to actually try to slow down and think <laughs> about the, the shortcuts that I'm about to use and just mention them briefly. So the server in question, uh, that, and I can tab complete it, but I actually have a, an alias, which I discussed at a previous meeting, uh, which is just that. I also have magic keyboard shortcuts that let me do all sorts of weird things on the line, like if I needed to get to the beginning of it. So I'm in my server now. I just SSH'd in. SSH is uh, a pretty common way of logging in to a, a command line interface on a server. It's all encrypted. That's an important thing to know. If you've ever heard of Telnet before, it's sort of like Telnet with encryption and other magic stuff. So it's a way of remotely administrating a box uh, and very, very common in the, in the Unix world. But a lot of, because it's common, it gets a lot of attacks. And you can see these on, on my system log files Names will be different depending on what you're using, but mine are in, they'll probably be in var log, or var log rather, and off.log is seemingly pretty common. Oops, I don't have permissions to see that. And probably don't ever want to open it with a text editor because you are only reading it, you don't want to write to a log file. So let's see, uh, illegal, no. What is a what is a string that he uses? I have to search down. It's happen all the time, although they happen less because of. You may be getting much less. Yeah, I'm getting much less. Well, here's some though. These are a good example. This is actually they send like a disconnect packet multiple times, in the hopes of triggering a buffer overflow in SSH. I think because for one connect you get multiple disconnects. So yeah, it's two one nine uh, two three four, which I think is the Chinese IP. Oh, also, I get some other stuff in the logs that are a bit confusing. Right there, it says head HTTPD. That's just because it's a side effect of something else that I do. That's not germane to this topic. But anyway, so all these things pile up in a log file. 
And I've used solutions in the past which just kind of monitor the log files and then they basically see who's trying to connect to you and if they're failing a lot, they block them with a, a, a rule on the firewall, like the machine's own firewall. So that's cool. Uh, one I used to use was called fail to ban It was written in Python and it was complicated. Like I had to spend a lot of time reading uh, a web-based manual with multiple links and sections about different actions you could take really complicated. And then someone suggested to me I try SSH Guard. And SSH Guard is entirely documented in a single man page. And it's, it's configured with the arguments that you pass to it, uh, which this ends up being configured in a services file. So once again, that'll be different depending on what you're using. But it's really simple. So by default, all of these are optional. The only thing you really have to do is make sure that it can read from a log file which you do by passing it dash l source, so you can pass it uh, var log auth dot log, whatever your system is using. But it can also be fed things directly from syslog, so syslog being where the logs are coming from, it's like a system-wide thing. So it can be fed the log files directly and it can immediately act upon them. So uh, all I had to do, and this is kind of a short talk because it's not a whole lot to talk about, so we'll talk about things around it, is I had to edit its it's a file that starts it. I didn't do this necessarily the best way. Really? Hold on a second. Uh, that would take too much time. I don't have my magical file completion on this box, which is somewhat annoying. Yes, Josh. Question. Um, so with these types of automatic banning systems, yes. Um, where do they store the list? Is there the chance that somebody could decide to uh, try to fill up your hard disk through um, various connection attempts? Depending on uh, the ones I've I don't know what this one is using as a database. I think they could do that. The uh, easy fix for that would be to use a ring buffer. So you could just only keep X number, a certain number of ones and new ones would pop it off. But you have to imagine right now, I'm not getting any attacks from IPv6 address space. Yeah, I was going to say IPv6. You so you can keep really every easy. single. So an IP address, we can think we can reason about, reason about this pretty accurately. An IP address is is 32 bit, which is eight uh, multiple of eight uh, four, so four bytes. So four bytes times two to the 64th, not two to the 64th. Sorry, two to the 32nd. That's two to the 32nd is four oh. billion. Not a, it's still not a huge amount of data. So yeah, IPv4 isn't too bad. IPv6 Let's see, two to the thirty second is that number times uh, per that's eight bytes per address would be that number. It's a sixty-four bit. And it's that number of bytes is mebibytes, which is the one everyone actually uses. It's about thirty-two. Wow, that's actually a bit bigger. It's getting in the, in the gigs range, but that's still not a lot of data in consideration of how that's big. That's 32 gigs of data. What is it? What is the stupid name for Gibby uh, Bytes? Gibby Bytes? Gibby Bytes. It's Gibby Bytes if you want the base 2 one, which as a programmer, I only like the base 2 one. So yeah, 32 gigs. So you, if every IP in the, if I blocked every IP address in the world, then I would be using 32 gig, and, I, and it probably can store it more efficiently than that, because you could probably just, after a certain number, you can block the net mask. Even the bit mask or something? Yeah, so yeah, that's not terrible. Right. So that's what we do. We just take char carve off the entire subnet for China. See, for my problem is people say that, just but it's not people. just China. It's no. Indiana. If I did that, if I did that, I would be blocking most of the United States. Right. Well, and what, what triggers it to block? Is it a bad password attempt? It's anything. So any any connection failure is pr that get Pam sees is a problem because Pam never really should see my auth because I don't use passwords. I use SSH's native encryption. So if you don't have an SSH key, a physical file, and uh, you... I'm just asking, does this make, make you vulnerable to a SIN attack with mm -hmm. forged headers? Oh no, you have to actually like make a, a you proper... You make a real TCP connection? Yeah. Okay. Uh, although it does see the multiple acts or the multiple NACs, whatever the thing, whatever command you send, or is it resend, or whatever the thing is that says you're closing the connection, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, apparently multiple those triggers it, which I'm fine with because that's how the jerks from China were attacking me most recently with the, there was multiple connections a second and then for every 10 connections there was like 100 disconnects from those 10 connections. 
and there was some kind of buffer overflow in SSH, a couple of buffer overflow, but some kind of, there was some vulnerability relating to connection parameters that was fixed, so I don't know. Um, when? The last 10 days or so. I run Arch Linux, I update everything every day, so I live on the edge. <coughs> Which is not recommended necessary. So here's the things I tweak. By default, SSH guard, I don't remember what the defaults are on the man page. It, it has it mixed in a big wall of text. So we could go searching through whatever the defaults were. I decided on my own defaults. And my own defaults are P. Uh, we're actually going to have to open the man page, aren't we? So we need to get rid of that. And we need another window on the server. Let me know if the font size is not big enough. So P. Is pardon minimum interval and that's in seconds. And so I chose uh, 60, 604,800 seconds, which I think is more than a week. Um, that would be, you can tell that I uh, use the units program a lot because I do. Wait, that's not. I think day, yeah, seven days. So the minimum interval that it will ban you is seven days. And uh, S60, so uh, that one was, S is the prescribed interval. I think explains S much better later in the manual. Otherwise we'll forget about an algorithm after that many seconds. So we forget about it. All things are forgiven in a period of time that I think is an hour, uh, a day, 36, no, that's 3600 uh, 36 seconds is an hour. An hour. I think that's an hour. 86,400 is a day. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, much less. Hour. So in an hour, so if you, you're allowed to, no, I think that's two hours. No, one hour is 3600. Okay, okay, so it's one hour. It backs off, so if you, you're allowed to screw up twice within one hour, that's what the math was. Because where's the twice coming in? It, Twice is actually rough. When I say twice, that's not really what it is, because it assigns a danger threshold uh, to different types of things that it sees in the log. And these are built into SSH guards, so they're not. And fail to ban, you'd have to define all these yourself in config files. And when the definitions changed, you had to merge in upstream changes to your config files. And it was, so 20 is the default danger threshold, which is dedicated by A. This is, this is all looking really horrible, so if you want to see what this kind of looks like. It all can fit on one line on a very large display. But it is all one line. Anyway. So 20 is a danger level. So every attack, every every kind of failed connection is about a 10, a 10 units of danger. So two ends up being two. And then after the third 